Hey everyone, John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze. So I received some feedback from a random person on the internet that I should not be recommending the Celestron Nexstar 8SC mount. He asked me, do you own one? And no, I don't. I have the AVX mount, which is an equatorial mount. Same optical tube, though. The Nexstar 8SC is an alt azimuth mount. Totally different, apparently. So anyway, we found someone that has the Nexstar 8SC, and we're gonna pay him a visit. This is Learn to Stargaze. So we're here at Dave's house. Let's see if he's home. Hey, John, how's it going? Dave, how you doing? Nice Good to, to see, see you. you. Wait, what's this? You can't buy happiness, but you can buy a telescope, and that's pretty much the same thing. I think we've come to the right house. So, Dave, Dave, right? Yes. Dave, okay. How long have you been observing? When I was eight years old, my father took me outside and showed me the constellation Orion, and I've been observing ever since then. So, two, three weeks? 60 years. So I saw you in the news lately. Can, can you tell us why? why? Why are you in the news? Oh yeah, so the International Astronomical Union named an asteroid after me. What, what asteroid? Well, it's number 10047. Are, are we gonna be okay? It's in the main belt and it's a very circular orbit. We're safe. You sure? Absolutely. Okay. Should we should we talk about the telescopes now? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. All right, so this is it. The Celestron Nexstar 8SE telescope. Now this telescope is a Schmidt Cassegrain design. You'll see it advertised as SCT. Now this telescope is perfect for observing the moon, the planets, and even deep sky objects. That's why it's one of the most popular telescope designs ever made. So I frequently found this telescope used online for under $1,000. New, this telescope goes for about $1,300 US dollars. That's not exactly an entry level price point. So Dave, who's this for? If you're looking for a schmidt Cassegrain telescope with go-to capability, this or its six inch kid brother is not a bad choice. Are you sponsored by Celestron? No, are you? No, I just really like telescopes. Me too. So hypothetically, could this telescope be used to see your asteroid coming? Uh, no, I think it would be very difficult to see my asteroid visually. So it'll hit us first before we even know. Uh, it's never going to hit us, John. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're outside. It's nighttime, as you can see, and we're going to learn how to use this telescope. Are you ready? I'm ready. So Dave, this telescope is powered. Can you tell us how would you recommend we power this telescope? Well, it does come with a battery uh, holder for eight AA batteries, but I don't recommend that. So you recommend we should get an external power supply for this telescope? That's right, and they come in many brands. It's up to you which one you get. So we're about to turn it on and align the telescope to the sky. What's the first thing we need to do? Well, actually, I recommend that you level the telescope, but if you have a little bubble level, uh, it just makes everything go better from here on in. Can I use my phone? My phone has a level. If you have a, an app in your phone, that's close enough. Awesome. So is there anything I need to do? Do I need to have it in sort of a home position? Does the telescope need to be pointed north? No, not at all. Uh, it's gonna be very easy to align this telescope if you can see the stars. So the first thing we need to do is just turn it on? Yes. Just turn it on. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> so so Dave, I did, I did some math. Now we're in trouble. Your, your asteroid is like five kilometers wide, right? Yep. And there's iron there? I'm looking into the mineral rights. So I, so based on the density of your asteroid, there's like 200 trillion kilograms of iron. I can't, I can't imagine it. Well, based on my calculations, you could construct 4 million replicas of the Titanic. What, what are you gonna do with all those ships? All right, so we've just leveled the telescope What's the next most important thing we need to do? Well, you really need to make sure that your finder telescope is aligned with your telescope. And uh, you can do that during the day using a distant object and fine tune it later on at night. So you've got a red dot finder here. Are there any other finders you would recommend? Yes, I actually like the kind of uh, finder that has projects a bullseye onto the screen rather than the red dot. Awesome, so a bullseye finder is definitely what you recommend. Yes. Okay. So now assuming your finder is aligned with the telescope, so you've used a distant chimney or something to do that, 
Now are we ready to align it to the night sky so it knows where it's pointed? Okay, so first we need to we need to turn on the telescope. We have to tell it where it is. We have to tell it what the date and time is. And we have to tell it what time zone it's in. And you have to tell it what the whether you're a daylight saving time or not. And if you get any of those wrong, the alignment's gonna fail. Okay, so let's do that now. So yeah. we've turned on the telescope and the hand controller is saying, uh, press enter to begin alignment. So I'm going to press enter. And here's something you must know. It doesn't ask you where you are, and it should. So what I do is I press undo, and it tells me that I'm in Halifax, Canada. If that's not where you are, then you have to go through the, the list of cities or even do a custom location with latitude and longitude. Then you say enter. It's asking you for the time, hours, minutes, and seconds, and you just type that in with the number keys. You enter that. It asks you if you're a standard time or a daylight saving time. You choose that with the up-down button and enter that. And then it's asking you uh, what time zone you're in. Now here's the trick. I told it I'm in Halifax, but it thinks I'm in the Eastern USA time zone which is not right, so I need to change that to zone minus four hours. Now it wants to know the month, day, and year, and you enter those with the number keys. And now it's saying it's ready to sky align. So now it wants me to uh, center three objects in the night sky, uh, bright objects, and you don't have to know what they are. Uh, so you just pick one, let's say it's Jupiter, and then I just use the arrow keys to move Oh, the telescope's moving. So you don't need to know it's Jupiter. No. But you just see a bright thing in the sky. That's right. And, and you so point this is it. where you use your finder. You use your finder to center Jupiter as best you can. And then you press align. And you center the object in the eyepiece with the same arrow buttons, but they move much slower because it's a magnified view. And then when you when you center the object in the eyepiece, then you press a line and you're finished with object one. The next thing you do is center object two. So I, now I'll move this telescope and it moves very quickly. So now we're moving to object two. Let's say it's a bright star over here. Now I happen to know it's Dana, but you don't need to okay. know that. And again, you, you line it up in the finder scope and then you press en enter and then you press a line after you've uh, centered it in the eyepiece. Now it wants object three. All right, on to object three. So another bright target, maybe yeah, one so, over here. So it's good to get three things uh, in widely separated parts of the sky to get a good sky alignment. So I'm going to go over here and uh, I'm going to pick out, uh, there's a bright star up there. I think it's in the square of Pegasus. And again, I'm going to center it in the finder and then enter, and then I center it in the eyepiece, and I press align, and I'm waiting. So assuming it was, these were three real bright objects, you would now, it would say align success, Yes. and you would be good to go and find your first target. Absolutely correct. It's, it has come back and said it's, Alignment is perfect. You, you're, now you can go ahead and uh, look at uh, a planet or a Messier object or an NGC object or a star or whatever is in the, in the list here. All right, so say we want to go to the moon. How do we do that? Well, you hit planet, believe it or not. You hit planet and then you cycle the up down buttons until it goes through all the planets. When you find moon, then you just enter it and uh, then it will automatically slew to the to the moon. Fantastic. So now that we're done observing the moon and planets, we want to get on to deep sky objects. Do you have any tips and tricks for viewing some of the dimmer targets in the night sky? Well, obviously you're going to see more if you go to a dark sky um, site where there's no light pollution. But having said that, even from the backyard here with this telescope, it has enough light gathering power that you can pick out some of the brighter uh, deep sky objects, for instance, the Orion Nebula. There's a few bright star clusters like the uh, um, Pleiades and uh, the Beehive in Cancer. 
and even one or two planetary nebula. So you can view M57, for example, the Ring Nebula, and maybe even the Dumbbell M27. So now's a great time to mention my latest book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, based on a 200-year-old stargazing list from the French common hunter, Charles Messier. This book is organized by season, so there's always something to see in your backyard telescope. And if you observe all the objects in this book, you can apply for a certificate and pin from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And I helped edit it. <laughs> Alternatively, if you're in the United States and you observe 70 of the targets listed in this book, you can also apply for a certificate there. So John, why do the Americas only have to see 70 targets to get their certificate? Well, I don't want to speculate, but the details are all listed in the back of this book. So definitely check out 110 things to see with a telescope.